Hey everyone, today I decided to share with you five useful tips and tricks for working with Visual Studio. Now anyone doing .NET development knows that Visual Studio is hands down the best IDE that you can get. The problem is that it's such a massive tool that most developers hardly scratch the surface when it comes to its capabilities, not to mention taking advantage of all of the helpful features that it offers that make our lives a lot easier. Now one thing Microsoft is not very good at is sharing with us all of the goodies that come in each new version. So in part one of this series, I'm gonna share with you five useful tips and tricks that you may or may not know about. If you learn anything new in this episode, go ahead and click that like button. And I'd love to hear about any tips and tricks that you have for working with Visual Studio. So if you have any, go ahead and throw them down in the comments section and let me know about them. So the first tip we're gonna look at is the quick launch. You'll find the quick launch located up in the upper right hand corner of Visual Studio. Now it's been here quite a while, but Still, most people don't know about it, and even I only recently started using it earlier this year. It's a very handy tool. In fact, I think it's the most important tool or the most useful tool in Visual Studio because it allows you to navigate to any feature of Visual Studio just by typing it in. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say, for example, you want to turn on line numbers. I don't have any line numbers turned on. Now, not everybody remembers where that is, and I certainly don't ever remember where line numbers ends. You can go into the tools options and try and fool around in there. Or we can just type in line number into quick launch, and we'll get a couple options here. So you'll always end up with a search online for NuGet packages matching whatever you typed in. We don't want that. You get a most recently used list. So if you use this quite a bit, um, it remembers what you search for and then your options. Now the options window is where this particular result showed up and that just happens to be what we want. So we'll click that. And when we do, we're taken to the options window and you'll see that we have line numbers as an option that we can check. So again, it's extremely useful, but that's not the only thing. Let's say you wanted to enable the bookmarks window, but you can't quite remember exactly which menu it's in. Is it in view? Is it in toolbars? Where is it? Well, you don't have to worry about knowing where it is because you can just type in bookmark and we'll see under the menus, there's an option for bookmark window. So we can click that and now the bookmark window shows up. But it's also context sensitive. So let's say we're in a code file and we type bookmark once more. So we have specific menu options such as toggle bookmark. So if we click on that, now we have a bookmark for that particular line. So anytime you can't remember where something is, or if you just want to save yourself some time, go ahead and use quick launch and enjoy this handy feature. Now the next tip is on the similar vein, and that is the navigate to window. And you can get to that by pressing control and comma. Now I'm using Visual Studio 2013. If you're using 2012, you're gonna see a slightly different dialog window that's gonna pop up in 2013. It's a more succinct dialog. Now what this does is similar to Quick Launch, but instead of finding something within Visual Studio itself, you're going to look for something within your code base. Let's say we remember the name of a particular method that we're looking for, but we don't quite know which class it was in. So we can just type in work, and we see we get a list of not only the worker class, but also files with work in the name. We have worker name as a property. We have do some more work, and then we have do some work method. So what Navigate2 does is allows you to search for something if you don't quite remember exactly what it is. For those of you who use ReSharper, this may seem pretty familiar to you because ReSharper also has a similar feature. So again, Quick Launch will let you search for anything within Visual Studio IDE and Navigate to, which you can bring up with Control Comma, will allow you to search for anything within your code base. Next up is a fairly recent addition to Visual Studio. It actually ended up in 2012, and that is the Peak feature. So what does Peak do? Well, let's start off by examining this line of code here. 
we're invoking the do something method on the instance of the dummy class. But what exactly does do something do? Well, we can figure it out by navigating to it. We can either F12 or we can right click and go to definition. When we go to definition, we navigate away from the code file we are originally in and we end up in the dummy class file inside of the do something method. Now this is great because we can come in here and we can look and see what exactly this method is doing and then make changes as necessary. But the problem is that we are taken away from the original code that we are looking at. So what peak does is allow us to view or navigate to this particular method without actually leaving where we currently are. We can invoke peak using alt F12 or right click and choose peak definition. Now, instead of navigating to the dummy class file in a new window, we get a little preview window right underneath the line of code we are looking at. So inside of this window, we have access to the entire dummy class file and we can make changes as necessary. And then when we're done, we can save and do everything else as if this were a regular file. The only difference is it's just a minimal window that's convenient to work with. If you want to continue working with this file permanently, you can click on this icon here, which is promote the document, and it'll show up in your window tabs. Now, another good feature about this is we actually get nested peak windows. So we're currently peeking into the do something method and inside do something method, there's a call to invoke the do some work method. Let's go ahead and peek into that. Now you notice our peak window stayed where it was, but now we're inside the worker class file and we're viewing the do some work method. So again, we can work with this entire file if we want, but you'll notice that we have some little dots up here. This is pagination. So we can go back and forth to the different peak definitions that we are working with without ever losing our original spot or losing the context of our call stack that we're trying to work with. And it works for the same file as well. So let's peak definition on do some more work method, which is in the same file as the previous method, worker class. But now we've got three pages up here we can work with. Both of these are in worker class. And then this one is the dummy class. So we can just navigate back and forth as necessary. The next tip on the list is actually a debugging tip. So we're gonna go ahead and run our demo code. And we've ended up inside of the worker class, do some work method. Now we're sitting at a breakpoint and we're waiting to invoke the call to do some more work method. Now at the moment, this line of code has not been executed. It's just sitting there waiting to be executed. Now if we just scroll down a little bit, we'll see that we've got some useless code down here. And let's say that this is code that we don't really want to execute at this time, point in time. Well, we don't have to. We can simply right click on any line of code within the same method and go down to set next statement, or you can use control shift F10. And now what we've done is we've set the next line of code to execute to this initialization of the X variable. So if we hit F10 to continue, You'll see that we never hit the breakpoint down here in do some more work method because we skipped the execution of this line of code. So let's go ahead and get inside of this while loop and just run it a couple times. Uh, as you can see, this is going to take quite a long time and we don't want to go through this process and we definitely don't want to have our console window filled up with crap. So we'll go ahead and just end the execution by setting the next statement to the next line after the while loop or outside of the while loop. And we can continue execution from there. Now what's great about this is if you need to work with a method over and over and over again, you can just use set next statement to the beginning of the method and continue working with it just as if it was initially evoked. It's a little bit faster than writing a unit test and running unit tests. And so it's an extremely valuable tool during debugging because you can control the specific points of execution or the order of execution within your code. 
And our last tip is going to be very helpful for anyone who works with JSON and XML serialization. So at some point in time, you're going to end up with a JSON structure or even an XML structure. And you're going to need to turn that into a C sharp class so that you can do deserialization as it comes in. So if you're like me, you'll go onto Google, you'll find one of the many available tools that are online and paste your JSON in there and it's going to return back some C sharp code. It's not too tedious and it doesn't really take all that much time, but it's still an extra step that you don't necessarily want to do. But now we can skip that because Visual Studio allows us to do this automatically. So I've gone ahead and copied a JSON object and I'm going to paste special, paste JSON as classes. And what we get is two new classes. The first is a root object with the properties name and address. As you'll see in the JSON object, we have name as a string. And then address is a nested JSON structure with street and city. And we also have address class that was created for us with properties street and city. So it saves you a little bit of time. You don't have to go out to Google. You don't have to use external tools or rely on external tools. You just copy the JSON from the source and paste JSON as classes. Now we can do the same thing if you work with XML. So we've got a similar structure here, just an XML instead of JSON. And we're going to edit, paste special, paste XML as classes. Now this time we get something that's a little more verbose. We've got a person class, and then we have a person address class. Each one of these has serialization attributes added to it. And then you notice it's got the longhand property definitions with the backing fields, but you can go ahead and modify this if you want. All right, so those are the tips that I have for you this time. If you learned anything new, go ahead and click that like button. And if you have a favorite Visual Studio tip and trick, go ahead and add it to the comments. All right, that's it for this episode. Be sure to subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook, and visit CodePorn.com when you have nothing better to do. If you have an idea for an episode or want to be a guest on an episode, send an email to CodePorn.show at gmail.com and let me know. Thanks for watching.